morning, everybody. Welcome. Could you please take all your seats, please? Good morning. So today we're going to have our second session on international political economy. Before we start, let me make uh, an announcement about the complement d'etude. It was a bit complicated to organize a second session. That's why we have not yet uh, sent you an email, but we finally got the confirmation of the second, uh, second time slot. So there will be a complement d'etude on, on Tuesday from 8 to 10, and then there will be another one from 10 to 12. We will assign you to certain groups, to, to one of those two slots. Um, one clarification, because there were some emails. Each of you will participate in four sessions. So you will be assigned to a seminar slot and you will participate on four, four times. Just to make that clear, you're not going to come just once. You're going to come four, four times. That's important. So if you plan to do something else in that week, whatever, that's not something we can take into account, right? Just to clarify that. Um, there is one complication with this uh, second time slot, this new time slot on Tuesday from 8 to 10, which is there might be another course that you have, some of you might have taken another course. So there's a course on uh, Introduction à la Géographie and uh, Histoire économique internationale. Does any of you take one of those courses and on Tuesday from 8 to 10? So can you raise your hands? Tuesday 8 to 10. Okay, so some of you have take have cannot come on Tuesday from 8 to 10. So what how we're going to do uh, this is we're going to uh, we're going to assign you to into a slot or should should they write beforehand? No. Yes. So what you're going, what we're going to do is we're going to assign you into slo into into slo uh, into seminars either from on Tuesday from eight to ten or ten to twelve. If you happen to be in the slot from eight to ten and you have a course, write an email to Tanya saying you can come and then we will reassign you. Is that clear? Good. So that means that we can reduce the 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 number of students in uh, the complement d'études from 80 to 40, about roughly, right? So that's why we are doing this. So it might be a bit more complicated, but you're going to have better seminars. Good. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to talk about the historical approaches to international political economy. And can we come down a bit, please? Thanks. And we're going to talk first about mercantilism, and we're going to uh, we're going to talk about the origins, what's the background, the political background, because all the evolution of these uh, these ideas and these um, approaches is closely linked to the main two major political events at the time. Then we're going to talk about uh, the important writers and what their main recommendations are especially about the trade balance and the structure of trade. And uh, then we're going to move on to liberalism. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to talk about what is the background, the real world background that explains why liberalism became so strong, what the main recommendations are. And here we're going to talk about the so-called trade species flow model, which is a really powerful critique of the mercantilist approach. And then we're going to talk about how this all matters today. And we're going to look at different aspects here. We're going to look at how can we use these approaches to explain international political uh, e economic affairs today. And we're going to uh, examine how these ideas actually influence policymaking. So on the major evolution of these uh, of of these different approaches. What you can say is that mercantilism started, came first, and it's 
there is a general agreement that mercantilism emerged in the 1620s. Um, but actually, back then, it was not called mercantilism. Adam Smith, who this uh, famous liberal, he said, these writers are all, they, they, are, they are forming a mercantile system. So the label mercantilism was invented by, not by the mercantilists, but by a liberal, by Adam Smith. And Adam Smith directly responds to what he thinks these mercantilists were saying, but he clearly overstates how coherent these writers were as a group. They were not, there was not, no such coherent, unified mercantilist approach, but Adam Smith basically said there was one, and then he used that to, uh, to state his, his, his uh, alternative ideas. Then later in the 19th century, uh, late 18th century and then in the 19th century, economic nationalism emerged as a response to liberalism. So liber the li liberals emerged as a response to mercantilism and the nationalists emerged as a response to liberalism. That then uh, turned into a debate between the liberals and the nationalists and the Marxists. Then we see a split in disciplines where we see all these writers, they were both talking about political affairs and economic affairs. They did not distinguish between them. Then we see a split in the disciplines where we have more, uh, we have a greater turn towards purely economic uh, uh, approaches, which is neo -cla uh, classical economics and later neoclassical economics. It's actually classical economics, that's a mistake. And, um, and then uh, on the other side, we see political research, which back then is more uh, in terms of legal affairs and so on. Now it's important to note that these approaches then directly feed into those approaches that we see today. There was a movement which is, uh, was later labeled li liberal idealism in international relations, and you probably heard of that. Uh, one proponent and representative of this was Woodrow Wilson uh, in the interwar period, who thought about how we can actually pacify the international system uh, with certain ideas that were coming from the liberal school. Again, in response to this, and after the Second World War, we saw the rise of uh, realism and neorealism. So liberal idealism directly connects to classical realism, uh, uh, liberalism. Realism and neorealism directly connect to nationalism and mercantilism. Some of the key assumptions are exactly the same. For instance, relative gains, the importance of relative gains in the international system. Then neoliberal institutionalism, which emerged as a response to neorealism, again, builds on many ideas that we already saw in classical liberalism. For instance, that trade uh, promotes peace. So we see a direct link between these classical approaches in international political economy and the main theories today in international relations. That's important to note. So the guiding questions today are, how do these traditional schools still matter? Why should we care about them? And as we're going to see, they re-emerge again and again in, as ideas in practical policy making until today. And we probably, so we, pro we live in a very liberal international system today, which is highly legalized and it's open to trade and so on. But we see strong, a strong tendency, we've always seen a strong tendency towards mercantilist behavior. And this tendency has even increased in the last maybe decade. So we're going to discuss what about this international system is uh, mercantilist uh, or nationalist and what about it is liberal. And uh, then we're going to ask to what extent these schools can actually help us to explain what's happening. And here we see that we will see that there's alternative approaches, analytical approaches, which might be more useful to understand what's going on, and we're going to discuss those and a little approaches then next week. So I'm going to start with mercantilism, and I'm going to subsume nationalism actually onto this, uh, this, this, uh, this part. And national, uh, mercantilism emerged mostly in England in the 19th century, but it then diffused all over Europe, and it was a very practical uh, practical literature that was dealing with many practical questions. Uh, for instance, uh, mostly commercial issues, the effect of tariffs, uh, 
how countries should organize uh, trade and what's useful uh, to, to increase wealth. But what's important here is, as a key theme, is that they explicitly talk about how trade and wealth, so how the, the, the wealth of private actors, of the merchants, is directly linked to the, the power of a state. And that's why it's political because they make a clear linkage saying that if, uh, we, if, if, the, if, we, if, the, if, if private actors are, are wealthy, that feeds into greater power of the state and the other way around. Powerful states find it more easy to produce wealth for their citizens. And that's why it's uh, uh, a political economy literature, not just an economic literature. The context here is that during the same period of time, <coughs> we saw the emergence of the nation state. So from international relations, you should know what happened in the 1600s. In the 1600s, we saw the emergence of the current international state system. And what happened back then that was so critical for international relations uh, until today? Remember that from your previous international relations classes? You want to? The of so there, there was the Treaty of Westphalia, which was a major breakpoint in the history of the international system. And why? What's important about this Treaty of Westphalia? Yes. Exactly. So the Treaty of Westphalia, or it was actually a series of treaties, ended the Thirty Years War, which started as a religious, uh, religious war, but then turned into a war between the great powers. And until then, what, uh, what happened is that countries always interfered with the domestic affairs of other countries. And for instance, in about uh, religious affairs, it started about uh, uh, the uh, in Bohemia, when they, when when the king uh, tried to interfere with, uh, tried to impose his religion on the on the countries on and on the nobles, and then uh, foreign countries like Sweden started to intervene, and the Treaty of Westphalia established the norm of sovereignty. That's really critical here. It established the norm of sovereignty, uh, which means that there is a centralized government that has the control over a certain territory and other countries would not interfere with the domestic affairs in this territory. That's important, that's sovereignty. And this is the time when this happened. So we saw the emergence of the national uh, centralized uh, nation states, and with this emergence of national, uh, national uh, centralized nation states, the governments of these nation states started to needed to have a foreign economic strategy. They needed to formulate a foreign economic policy, a trade policy, a monetary policy, and so on. And that's why all this was being discussed, right? So there's a clear link again between the evolution of the international system and these topics that were being discussed, uh, which were often very economic. In terms of the philosophic, philosophical background, what was prevailing back then was a more Hobbesian or Machiavellian uh, view of uh, real uh, uh, of realism, where international politics was seen as a zero-sum game, and that again is an idea that was being picked up by the neorealists. That if I win something, you're going to lose, and if you win, I'm going to lose. That's a very conflictuous approach to international politics, which will be rejected by the liberals. And that's the basic presumption that we're going to see also in mercantilism. That's really important. And I think I'm going to simply quickly review the main ideas of mercantilism by presenting some of the main writers. And one of them was Thomas Mann, uh, who was a um, 
the director of the East India Company in, in, the, in Great Britain at the time, but he was also a merchant and a private, uh, a private uh, businessman. And there was a big debate, there was a big recession, a depression in Britain in the, six, uh, in the 1620s. And the king asked two people, de Malines and Mann, to, de to explain to him why this depression was happening. And they came up with very fu uh, fundamentally different ideas. So de Malines said there were speculators, and he was thinking about Dutch speculators, who were manipulating the exchange rate of the of, of Great Britain, and that was harming the economy of Great Britain. Mann said, no, it's different. There was this great war on the European continent, and that war depressed demand for British goods, and that then reflected in the economic downturn in Great Britain. So there's two very different explanations, but what's really important is that both of them focused on the trade balance as a central component to understand uh, the, the, the well-being, the economic well-being of Great Britain. So there were some in innovations here. So they, uh, especially in, in Mann's work, they started to introduce the idea of supply and demand. They looked at empirical data or empirical patterns to explain what's happening. So that's a big revolutionary uh, approach at the time because before it was often uh, explanations were often based on Christian doctrines and not on empirical work and, and on, on, on logic, right? So that's really important here. Now the key conclusion that Mann was drawing was that countries should have or Britain should try to have a positive trade balance. What does that mean? What's a positive trade balance? So you export more than you import. And this is nicely reflected in the statement, which is really famous, in his report saying that the ordinary means to increase our wealth and treasure is by foreign trade. So he proposes to, to, to increase trade uh, to become more wealthy, but in a particular way, because he says we must ever observe this rule to sell more to strangers than we consume of theirs in value. So we should always export more than we import. And that <coughs> debate is still really, really important today, right? You've probably heard about this big conflict about current accounts and trade balance and so on. This goes all the way back to this. Another example, and uh, I'm giving you this example uh, of Jean-Baptiste Colbert because he makes an even more explicit link between state power and, and trade. So he was a public official, he was the French finance minister uh, under Louis XIV, and his goal, the, go uh, the, the goal that we see in his writings is clearly to increase state power. So the economy is now subordinated to a political goal which is state power. Mann was still thinking about wealth and growth and income and how it's related to, to, to power. But here, the prime goal is not wealth, but it's, uh, it's power. And he, again, says we should have a favorable trade balance, we should have a trade surplus, and we should pro do this by promoting import substitution. Uh, and he, does this, he did this, he implemented this idea in practical policy making. So what he did is he uh, he initiated the foundation of the so-called so Manufacture Royale de Glace de Miroir. Uh, and he did this to have, because most of the glasses were produced in Venice. And he started this new manufacture in uh, this new business in uh, France to substitute the imports from Venice, right? And he succeeded. So eventually it was even forbidden to import glass. So that's a great example where how a, a, a finance minister or government starts to interfere with the domestic affairs to, for the purpose of uh, uh, state development or in, uh, and, and, and um, industrialization. So that 
leads us later to nationalism. So I'm, I'm, I'm now jumping ahead because between mercantilism and nationalism, we have liberalism. So I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but I'm going to subsume it uh, under the label mercantilism simply because they are fairly similar. Nationalism emerged mostly outside England, uh, in Austria, in Germany, also in the United States as a response to liberalism in the 19th century. And the main topics now were a bit different. They, they responded directly to the liberal ideas that focus so much on individual interests, the interests of an individual citizen, a voter or a consumer. So now what they do is they say the liberals forgot to actually think about the nation because the liberal interest might not always coincide with the national interest. And again, the background here is uh, the purpose of state building, industrialization and the development of an economic strategy. Because we are now living in a world of British hegemony. Britain is way the most powerful country in the 19th century. The uh, United Sa States just gained independence and they had to start to develop their own foreign economic policy. They needed to build their own country. And therefore, they were so much concerned about how they should do this in the presence of this major, uh, major player in the international economy, which was Britain. We also saw German unification at the time. And again, we see this uh, this necessity of building this unified state and formulating a, a trade policy for this new state. And one of the major proponents, uh, most important proponents here was Alexander Hamilton, who was uh, the so-called first national economist, which is a kind of first uh, finance minister of the United States. And he submitted this uh, uh, report on the subject of the manufacturers uh, to the Congress in the United States. And what he proposed is that we should take into account the different development stages. And that's why the, the term national economics, uh, uh, where it comes from. We should consider these development stages, which means that countries on different stages of development need different trade policies and different economic policies. And again, he proposes the use of subsidies and import duties for defensive purposes. And one major role is <coughs> here is the development of infant industries. That's already what we saw uh, uh, what Colbert did, right? He tried to develop a new industry, glass manufacturer, manufacturing in France, which, and he uh <coughs> used an early form of uh, infant industry protection. And what Hamilton says is that the undertakers of a new manufacturers have to contend not only with the natural disadvantage of a new undertaking, so there's natural uh, uh, entry barriers into a market, which are already uh, uh, complicating things for new, uh, new businessmen. And in addition, they have to deal with the gratuities and remunerations which other governments bestow. So other governments are paying subsidies and helping their own businesses. And of course, he was thinking about Britain here. So we need to do the same. We need to help our businesses as well in this international competition. And these ideas then were picked up by Friedrich List. And Friedrich List observed, he was in exile in the United States. And he observed what uh, Alexander Hamilton was doing. <coughs> but different to a Alexander Hamilton, who was a practitioner, he was more an academic and was trying to build a more theoretical foundation for these ideas that, were that, he, that he liked. And what he says is that often, so we have a national interest, so we have a nation that has an own interest, survival, wealth, and so on, and uh, we have private individuals living in this country, in this nation. And the interests of the two might, might actually be contradictory. So we're going to see in a moment, Adam Smith said there's a harmony of interests. So if we let private individuals pursue their egoistic, selfish uh, 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 interest, this will automatically produce 
an outcome that's in the interest of the whole society. And he says, no, that's not true. And uh, again, he picks up the idea of stages of development. He says we have um, an agricultural stage, and in this agricultural stage, free trade might be something useful. Then we have uh, matu a mature stage where we have uh, in an industrialized economy, and again, in this mature stage, free trade might be a great strategy. But then there's this intermediate stage uh, where we have the early days of industrialization, and during this period, it's actually useful to be protectionist, to protect your own economy, to pr protect your own new businesses, and allow them, give them room to develop. So he doesn't really uh, oppose this idea that eventually we might, uh, we might evolve into this world society uh, that the liberals were thinking about, but he says we're, gonna, we're not going to reach it in the way that the liberals say. We reach it by state build nation building, state building, and then once we all reach a mature state, we might actually have this world society, but not before that. And the conclusions were I basically identical to those by Hamilton. And this statement nicely uh, summarizes this, uh, this, these ideas, where Liz says, between each individual and entire humanity, so we've got entire humanity, which is the world society, and we've got individuals, uh, uh, and between them, we have the nation. There stands the nation. And I would indicate, as the distinguishing character of my system, nationality, and so he distinguished himself from the liberals by focusing on, on the role of the nation. There's this nice little anecdote that illustrates how important these ideas were. So Robert Wade, who is a development economist, uh, he traveled to South Korea in the 1960s or 70s, and he went to uh, university libraries, and what he discovered was long shelves with this book. So these ideas, or this, bo this book was read a lot in South Korea, and it was actually implemented. So the Korean development strategy uh, back then was in part based on the idea, on these ideas that we see here, right? So this is not, not just some obscure old writing, it's actually a writing that was really important in practical political economy today, or not, not uh, not far in the past. So to wrap this up, there's some key recommendations. First, we should have a positive trade balance. And to achieve this, we should have export subsidies, import restrictions, and infant industry protection. I haven't talked too much about this, but what's also important in these writings is that they distinguish between less and more valuable types of economic activity. Agricultural or raw material extraction is less desirable because it helps less, it's less useful to build state power, while manufacturing is, uh, is, is more valuable because it directly leads to greater, uh, greater power uh, and, and greater income. Another main recommendation is, or idea is that, we sh and that matters for the debate with the liberals, that states should try to accumulate a lot of money, or specie as it's called, <coughs> specie, gold and silver. So by definition, a positive trade balance means that you have an inflow of money or gold. Why is that the case? So if you have a, trade, uh, a positive trade balance, why do you accumulate gold or reserves? Yeah. Well, because you export more than you import, and the exports have, have to be paid, and not paid by gold. So there's always a gold and gold competition. Exactly. So we are living in a gold standard, and, and by selling stuff, you're going to get gold. And what, and, and what Colbert says, for instance, is that accumulating gold is equivalent to accumulating power. So he says, it is simply and solely 
the abundance of money within a state which means the difference in its grandeur and power. And this is then going to be rejected by the liberals. So the liberal critique or the liberal response to mercantilism emerged uh, in the 18th and 19th century. And what Adam Smith was describing in his famous book is the so-called mercantile system where uh, those uh, certain merchants and businessmen were colluding with, uh, with, the, with the king and the, and the state uh, to extract a lot of rents. And this happened at the, at the disadvantage of the ordinary people. So they were able to, to build monopolies and so on with the help of, st of, 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 of the government. And that allowed them to charge higher prices and uh, to extract rents from the system. So initially, what they, uh, what they looked at was um, mostly economic topics again, wealth, prices, markets, competition. But they very quickly started also to talk about the inter interdependence of order. So the interdependence of a political system with the economic system, how the two are related and therefore automatically the role of government. Politically, the context was uh, a movement away from the absolute rule of, of, of kings towards a more, not really a democratic system, but a greater participation of parliaments, for instance. That's what happened in the Glorious Revolution in Britain. That was a, a, a century-long struggle between, uh, between uh, the parliament and the king, and eventually those who favored a stronger parliament, a parliament won. We saw the American and the French Revolution, we saw the end of uh, the absolutism and the post-Napoleonic order. Philosophically, what they're building on is again on really important political philosophy works. Uh, the idea that, that individuals can behave rationally, uh, the idea that liberty and property is really important uh, uh, for, for the well-being of a country and so on. Really important here is that international politics now is a positive-sum game. Before, we said that if I win, you're going to lose. But the idea here is that we can actually both win. And uh, especially Ricardo then puts this on a, on a firm theoretical ground. So Adam Smith was uh, obviously the most important actor here. And we're going to encounter him again later when we talk about uh, how Adam Smith influenced, influenced the British Prime Minister in the, in the late 18th century. So Adam Smith was not only a philosopher. He tried to actively participate in policymaking and... and, and, and uh, and diffuse his ideas into the political uh, process. And what he, uh, one really important critique is that he says wealth and power is not equivalent to the amount of money that you hold, that, 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 or the amount of specie that, you, that you're having. So specifically he says, in the among the mercantilists there's a popular folly of, of confusing wealth with money. Wealth, money is not wealth. Simply because what matters is how much you can consume and not how much you, how on how much money you sit, right? Money only has a purpose of buying something. So, if you're running a trade surplus, what does that mean in terms of consumption? You can directly apply this to China today or to Germany maybe even to Switzerland. All these countries are having huge trade surpluses. What does it mean in terms of consumption? They consume less than they could live. They consume less than they could. They consume less than they produce, and but this production generates money, and that money is not spent for consumption, right? So you're foregoing consumption, and by the idea of liberals, or from the liberal perspective, you're, you're um, 
you're consuming your wealth, you're not really exploiting your wealth well. That's the idea here. So the conclusion here is that we should have free markets and the government should not interfere with uh, dom the domestic economy. And uh, in terms of trade, what Adam Smith said is, if a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we ourselves can make it, better buy it for of them with some part of the pro uh, produce of our own industry imp employed in a way in which we have an some advantage. So he is thinking about absolute advantage. He assumes that a country has an advantage in producing something and we should produce that good. And then we should exchange goods and that allows us to consume more. That's the basic idea here. This was then being picked up by Ricardo who again, who was a businessman but also a politician in the 19th century. And unlike Adam Smith, who talked about the absolute advantage, he talked about the comparative advantage. And that's important because what this means is that absolute advantage means that potentially some countries could not benefit from, from, from trade if you don't have an absolute advantage in producing anything. Comparative advantage, which you probably know from your class on international economics, and we're going to quickly review that next week, uh, in two weeks, Comparative advantage means that every country can actually benefit from trade. In addition, and that's a truly politically liberal idea, is that trade can promote peace. The more we trade, the more, uh, the more peaceful the international system will be. So what we should do is we should abolish trade restrictions and promote free trade. So he says, the economic principle of comparative advantage, a country may in return for manufactured commodities import corn even if it can be grown with less labor than in the country from which it's imported. So even if you have an absolute advantage in producing something, uh, it might be useful not to do that and you will gain and the other country will also gain from exchanging these goods. So these are all to some extent, philosophical differences. You, you come to different conclusions. So the mercantilists and the liberals come to different conclusions because they impose different assumptions. So the idea of having positive uh, sum game or zero sum game is to some extent simply an assumption that you can justify and you can justify both. You can justify it in both ways, in both directions. But what's really nice about this so-called pr uh, price specie flow model by David Hume is that it's actually a theoretical critique showing that, at least in the very long term, the mercantilist, uh, the mercantilist proposition of running a trade surplus cannot work. Eventually, just by pure logic, this trade surplus should go away. And that's what this uh, uh, price BC flow model says. Not only that, this model, we will see that again when we talk about international monetary affairs. This model tells you, it basically provides an adjustment mechanism under a fixed exchange rate. So we're going to talk about this uh, in, the in, in, in the section on mo international monetary affairs because here we have an adjustment mechanism if you have a trade deficit what's going to happen or how you what, what you should do to get rid of this uh, trade deficit or surplus. And that will then have distributional effects. Some people will win from this and some people will lose. And that creates a political conflict. <coughs> so we're going to go there in a few weeks, not now. For now, what we're going to do is we're going to work through this adjustment mechanism to see why the mercantilist recommendation cannot work in the long term. So we're going to start from this idea of running a trade surplus <coughs> that the mercantilist said we should do. So we already talked quickly about this. What's going to happen in terms of money and gold and so on? There's a mechanism that's being set off by running a trade surplus. So the first step in this mechanism is what? So you accumulate gold. So there's a gold inflow. And this is how it works. 
in very simple terms. So you have a British clothes producer, and he's going to a textile producer, and he's going to export textile textiles to France, right? So the the French merchant who buys this textile, he's going to he has to pay the British producer. So he's going to take his francs, he's going to exchange them into gold. He's going to go to the ba uh, the Bank of uh, of France, the central bank, exchange it into gold. Take the gold to the Bank of England to exchange it into British pounds and then take the pounds to pay the British pr producers. Right? That's the idea here. That's what's happening here. What does it mean for money? So there's a gold inflow, but what does it mean for the domestic economy? There's more money in the money supply. So there's uh, money supply increases. If money supply increases, what happens? Yes? Prices go up, exactly, which means what? So now British clothes become more expensive, yes. Inflation. So there's inflation, exactly, so the uh, price increase, which is, which is equivalent to inflation, exactly. The products become less of a value then, because the price goes higher, and then you export less. Exactly. Exports decrease and imports increase, right? Because British goods now are becoming uncompetitive. Remember, we have a fixed exchange rate. That's what we discussed last week. The gold standard means that we have a fixed exchange rate, uh, fixed exchange rate between francs and pounds. In an alternative system where we have a flexible exchange rate, there is more going on. The exchange rate might adjust. But for now, we're going to stick uh, to this fixed exchange rate system, the gold standard. What does it mean? Exports decrease, imports decrease, so the surplus disappears. So by definition, or by this logic, it's not possible to do what the mercantilists say you should do. You should run a trade surplus forever. That's what they say. But it's not going to work. Economically, it's not possible, at least under certain assumptions. Here, there's no countervailing uh, capital flows and so on. So today, it might be a bit more, s more complicated. But so this, there's factors that allow you to do this, to run a trade surplus for a very long time. But clearly, it's not possible forever as the mercantilists say. Or you have the equivalent uh, mechanism. Once you run a trade deficit, there's a gold outflow, uh, which sets off uh, a mechanism that leads to the, to the disappearance of the trade deficit. Question. Yes? So there would also be an adjustment mechanism, which uh, would look slightly different. So what would happen? So all this happens, right? You have a gold inflow, or you have a money inflow. Let's say you have a money inflow, right? Uh, money supply increases, domestic price increase. What would then happen? Under a flexible exchange rate. How do differentials in 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 inflation rates influence the exchange rate not necessarily immediately but in the long run right what would happen would so the exchange rate would appreciate which again has the same effect that the british goods are now suddenly more expensive than the f the french goods nobody wants to buy the british goods anymore therefore the trade surplus disappears so we're going to have it's an important question so we're going to have the same outcome but the mechanism is different and this different mechanism has different distributional effects. So in a few weeks, we're going to talk about how this, this mechanism that we, that we see here, um, this mechanism means that the country is pushed into a recession, which means that wages should fall, so labor suffers, at least in, uh, in nominal terms, right? Um, and therefore, labor will... Labor pays a lot of the cost here. So labor is opposed to this idea of having internal adjustment. This is called internal adjustment because it all works through domestic prices and domestic production. The other one that you pointed to is called external adjustment. You adjust the exchange rate. And one argument is that labor suffers less, workers suffer, suffer less uh, from e in external adjustment. You impose the adjustment on the other country. And therefore, it's less politically contentious to do it with a flexible exchange rate than with a fixed exchange rate. 
And that causes a political conflict uh, that then uh, uh, um, uh, can have serious, serious, uh, can produce political instability. So I'm just previewing what we're going to do in a few weeks. So you don't need to know this uh, by now. All you need to know is mercantilism doesn't work in the long term. I quickly want to mention one more person before the break, which is Richard Copton. I mentioned Copton already last week. He was a manufacturing a manufacturer, but he was also a member of parliament. And he was this figure that played this important role in the repeal of the Corn Laws. Last week we talked about the Corn Laws and um, how it was imposed as a protectionist measure to protect agriculture in Britain after the Napole Napoleonic War. Um, that those Corn Laws were repealed in 1846 uh, with the help of Richard Copton. In 1870, there was the so-called Copton Chevalier Treaty this trade agreement between Britain and France, and Copton was one of the initiators of this treaty. But more basic, so he was, he's, he had more, he was thinking more deeply about these things. And what he said is that, again, more trade leads to less war. You probably heard about, demo uh, about democratic peace theory and one in, uh, or and, and a related theory that's more systemic is that democracies trade more and trade is actually one of the most important mechanisms that lead to, to peace. And he, that's an early statement of this idea. In addition, he was thinking about, he was proposing to have international institutions because they would help to, uh, to build peace more easily. Um, so again, he wants to promote, promote free trade, not just for economic reasons, not just to increase wealth, but he wants to promote trade to increase the likelihood of peace or to, to, uh, to build peace. And he, this becomes clear here in the statement where he says, throughout the long agitation for free trade, the most earnest men who cooperated with us were those who constantly advocated free trade, not only because of the material advantages that free trade would produce, but for the far loftier motive of securing permanent peace between nations. He, by the way, he made also this statement that uh, he said that I believe that it has been said that one copy of the Times so this newspaper contains more useful information than the whole historical work of uh, Thucydides. So who, who was Thucydides? Have you heard about him? You should have. So what did Thucydides say? Thucydides is really important in international relations theory. He is an, he was a histori historian, but also a military officer in ancient Greece. And he described the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens. And what he described was then later being picked up by the realists and the neorealists. He said, all that matters is power and nothing else. And he described, basically he described the mechanisms of international conflict and international affairs that then uh, reflected in the work of the neorealists, right? So already, Copton in the 19th century, he opposed these ideas and, and he said, forget to keep this. What we should do is trade and have institutions and then uh, to keep this will become obsolete, right? Good, so let's take a break, come back at 20 past 11 and then we're gonna talk about how this all matters for today. <laughs>
Okay, I think we should start again. So, what we're now going to do, what we're now going to do is, we're going to discuss to what extent this is still important. So, should we talk about this at all? There is, I know many people who do, it, who teach international political economy and they don't talk about these things. So, this means because they think it's not that relevant anymore. So, why should we why should we why should we discuss all this? Are these schools still relevant today? What do you see in today's world that reflects one or the other and that helps us to understand what we see? Can you give me some examples? Is this relevant? Or what concrete examples do you see? Do you see specific policies that reflect one or the other? Yeah. Some policies were containing was the surplus of China and Germany, for instance. So th exactly. So there's this big <laughs> political discussion, which is now very prominent with the election of uh, Donald Trump as U.S. president, about the trade balance. But as I'm going to show in a moment, it already existed before. Trump just highlights it much more. So it's all about the trade balance and the idea is that having a trade deficit and the US has a huge trade deficit and it has had a huge trade deficit for a long time, the idea is that it's harming the US. So by, so by definition, if one country is having a trade deficit, some other country has a surplus. So the US, surplus, the US deficit is reflected in the Chinese surplus, the German surplus and so on. So we are in this mercantilist logic that having a trade deficit is actually bad for a country. Can you, s can you give me other examples? Yeah. For example, the Asian tariff, Taiwan, Singapore, Brunei, North, South Korea, for the numbers, <coughs> they develop uh, thanks to the, uh, the same KDG, countries between the states. So the development strategy of the, of the, of the Asian countries in the 1970s and 80s was based on the, of, on the idea of running a, a trade surplus. Uh, what else? How else could we, could we use these uh, theories to understand international political economy? So we could, for instance, and that's what uh, James Morrison does in the paper that was required for, for today, we could look at which policymakers are influenced by which, by which ideas. So Trump apparently seems to be following a mercantilist logic. So he is listening to, what, to these ideas that were promoted by the mercantilists. Some others might actually follow other advice, the ideas of liberals. So that's another way of looking at, of using these uh, traditional schools to understand what's going on. So we've got a few examples. In principle, I think we can all agree that we're living in, in an international liberal order. And you've heard this term probably when you discussed in the other courses in introduction to international relations, but also in, in international cooperation, you heard this term often uh, uh, with a, on the background of the political system, right? Not so much the economic system. So we see live in a liberal order because international law matters more and more, because international st uh, institutions matter more and more. But this is also the case in economic affairs. So we have multiple systems that we could classify as liberal. The first one is the one I described last week, which is the pre-1914 system, uh, the gold standard. The gold standard <coughs> is a an exemplar of an uh, international liberal system. Why is that the case? What's liberal about the gold standard? For instance, there were no restrictions to international capital flows. That was a requirement for the gold standard to work. 
we had this rise of trade agreements <coughs> and they were, they were um, trade agreements that tried to promote trade overall. So the Copton Chevalier Treaty was a trade agreement that did not seek to discriminate third countries. That's important. Many of the, of the trade agreements today do not have the purpose of uh, discriminating third countries. It was different in the interval period. So th we saw a lot of trade agreements, so the Ottawa Agreement, the imperial preference system, that tried to build blocks. That would not be liberal, right? But these trade agreements in the, in the 19th century, they were uh, truly liberal uh, enterprises. The post-1945 uh, system, so the first the Bret Bretton Woods system that we discussed last week, was a system where uh, capital, co capital flows were restricted, but nonetheless, it was a system that aimed at promoting free trade. So we had this so-called embedded liberalism where we have international multilateralism that also grants autonomy to domestic, uh, to domestic governments, but nonetheless, the key goal of the system and the key intention of the United States back then was to, provide to promote free trade. <laughs> And that actually worked, and it still works until today. Uh, European integration is another example, because for political, uh, from a political perspective, European integration, integration is built on the idea that international institutions and greater international integration uh, can prevent uh, war and can help us to increase, uh, to increase the, the stability of peace. And one of those uh, of, of the building blocks is the is bilateral trade. Again, we are building here on liberal ideas that uh, that free trade promotes peace. In terms of mercantilist policies, we can all we can also find fa uh, 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 a fair amount of examples. So, <coughs> what we have here is we have a system. The whole system is liberal, but within this liberal system. We see many policies that we could we could classify as mercantilist or post-mercantilist or so on. One example is um, <coughs> the development strategy that we saw in Latin America in the 1960s and 70s, which was based on import <coughs> excuse me on import substituting industrialization. So these countries tried to build an industrial base to uh, substitute the imports that they were receiving from industrialized countries. We're going to discuss this strategy in a few weeks when we talk about trade and development. Another example is infant industry protection. And here, Airbus is a good example. So Airbus was, or the Airbus project, was initiated by European countries, France and Germany, uh, with the start of the Europe of European integration. And back then, what those countries did is they granted a lot of subsidies to Airbus to actually c be able to compete to against Boeing, for instance, and the, and the American producers. And that eventually caused a lot of conflict between the United States and the European Union. So here, what I'm point referring to here is disputes in the World Trade Organizations, and I'm giving you the numbers. You could Google them, and you immediately find on the WTO website, you find a short description of these disputes. And what you will find is that uh, the United States complained at the WTO about those subsidies that European countries, mostly France and Germany, were paying to Airbus. And they said they were inconsistent with WTO law because they granted an unfair advantage to Airbus in its competition with Boeing. And this was going back and forth for a decade. So the WTO said, yes, uh, the subsidies are illegal under our rules. The EU said, or the European countries said, well, we don't care. Then the US appealed. So, so uh, then the US it was acknowledged that the U.S. was correct and the EU countries did not follow the, the verdict of the WTO ruling. And uh, the last verdict, the last ruling here was just uh, last year. So last year we saw this last ruling that 
that re uh, requested that European countries finally change their policy because they were granting subsidies that were not consistent with the WTO rules. So that's uh, a classic case of that that of a policy that used to be an infant industry protection. I think we cannot call Airbus an infant industry anymore, right? But it was based on the idea that we saw in Friedrich List's work that we should protect the new enterprises, at least for a while, but then it actually continued just to grant an unfair advantage to, to Airbus. Or there's a huge amount of debate about exchange rate policy. For instance, uh, exchange, uh, the exchange rate policy of China, and the accusation is that China is undervaluing its exchange rate to promote exports. <coughs> and this has been ongoing for a long time, and this conflict has existed for a long time. And what the, what the United States government is now doing is it every six month, months, it's, gonna <coughs> it's uh, issuing a report on foreign exchange policies. If you click on this link here, duh, duh, duh. what you find is the website where you can find all the reports which is here, right? So you can download a report uh, on this website of the US Treasury. So there's plenty of reports. And in this report, in this report, the United States is listing countries that they think are using unfair trade policies, unfair exchange rate policies, and policies that are harming the United States. And obviously, China is, is listed as a country that's doing this. But not only China, uh, Germany is listed, South Korea is listed, and Switzerland is also listed. So you see that the US at least is ac accusing these countries of following a mercantilist policy, um, or a mercantilist type of policy, and what Trump is proposing to do exactly the same, right? To take countermeasures which is also moving to a more mercantilist approach. So we see this debate between liberals and mercantilists in practical policy making today. We also see it in the academic debate. So there is a, a deba debate that's often labeled the neo-mercantilism debate. I'm just going to quickly review it. There's a huge discussion whether undervaluing the exchange rate is actually useful for <coughs> f to generate growth. So Paul Krugman is a uh, uh, has written on that, and he says that if you want a trade policy that helps employment, it has to be a policy that induces other countries to run bigger deficits and smaller surpluses. So, uh, for instance, a countervailing duty on Chinese exports would be job creating. An important point here is that Krugman points to an aspect that was highlighted by the mercantilists, which is the trade balance. <coughs> One thing that's different here in this argument is it's not about power. So it's not, uh, it's not the same idea that Colbert was, f uh, was promoting, for instance. He's not saying that we should run a trade surplus to increase power. It's all about jobs. So in that sense, it's Keynesianist, Keynes, uh, Keynesianist argument uh, that is in the tradition of mercantilist or mercantilist ideas, but for a different reason. It's not about power, it's about employment. Roderick, who is another famous uh, political economist, he points to more towards this more political power-related uh, 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 arguments. He says the mercantilist mindset provides policymakers with some advantages. Better feedback about the constraints and opportunities that private economic uh, activity faces and the ability to create a sense of national purpose around economic goals. So what he's saying is that economic affairs is also political in the sense that uh, it affects the national, uh, the national interest. So that's directly related to what Friedrich List was saying. The Economist, the journal, uh, found that so upsetting that they responded to Roderick, saying that Mr. Roderick doesn't try to calculate the cost of the strategy of export promotion. There's a huge opportunity cost there. Uh, for instance, you are, you are being exposed to currency risk. Or, what we discussed before, you're foregoing consumption. 
So China is not con Chinese citizens are not consuming as much as they could, and potentially as much as they should. So that's one way to uh, look at uh, today's political debates and uh, look at them from this traditional schools. Another way to look at them is uh, to actually take those ideas and take the basic presumptions and apply them to explain what countries are actually doing. So there's this famous paper by Steve Grasner, which is one of the earliest and one of the most important papers in international political economy and international relations, by the way. So what he takes, what he does, he takes a neorealist approach to explain international trade politics. He says the power distribution of the international system tells us what kind of system we are having, whether we have an open system or a closed system. <coughs> and he says it's all driven by relative gains. He says there's three factors, three aspects that countries should care about. First is income relative to the other countries. How does trade affect income of a country relative to other countries? How does trade affect stability relative to other countries? How does trade affect uh, power relative to other countries? And how does trade affect growth relative to other countries? So it's all about relative gains and the argument which has been criticized a lot, I'm just saying you, telling you what he says, is that for small and really large countries, so for the small countries and the hegemon, uh, relative gains dominate, while for those intermediate countries, <coughs> relative gains uh, are small, or they lose relatively to the, to, the, to the big countries. So, apply to the history of the world, this means that Britain in the 19th century gained because it was a really huge country, while Germany and France, those middle powers, they lost relatively to Britain. And that led him to, to make some predictions saying that, so it also depends on the, development, the level of development, so let's say this, the level of development is roughly equal, but we have mostly small states, so this is the size of nations, mostly small states, then the probability of an open trading system is moderate towards high. And if we have very unequal size of states, so if we have, we have a hegemon, and then we've got all the others, the hegemon forces the others to open their economies, and therefore we have a highly open system. But if we have a lot of intermediate states, large states, but not this hegemon, then we have low probability of an open system because countries like Germany and France and so on, they do not benefit from an open system. That's his argument. So the distribution of power in the system, either we have only small states or we have this huge state or we have lots of intermediate states and no hegemon, that affects whether we have an open trading system or a closed trading system. And then he says, look at, look at the history Britain in 1820 became the hegemon and they forced all the others to open up their markets and that's why we had this open trading system. Then British power was declining towards the end of the 19th century and it was really low in the interval period and that's why the system collapsed. And then the US became this hegemon and it forced or it induced everybody else to open up their markets and that's why we're now having this open trading system. So that's a near kind of neorealist argument applied to international political economy. <coughs> and a slightly different way of looking uh, using these, uh, these uh, theories and traditional schools is by looking how important these ideas, liberal ideas and um, mercantilist ideas were for specific policymakers and how they implemented these ideas in practical trade policy. And this is what James Morrison does, and that's the required reading for today. And you're going to discuss that in the Complement d'Etude extensively. I think it's a nice paper because it points to many different developments in international relations theory. So first, the paper is called Before Hegemony. Right? He refers to this idea of, to this famous book, called After Hegemony, 
who has heard of After Hegemony? Who has not heard about this book? So this book is one of the, the book After Hegemony by Bob Cohane <coughs> that was published in the 1980s. It's one of the most important writings in neoliberal institutionalism, saying that international institutions <coughs> can persist even if their hegemon disappears because they are self-maintaining. Self, uh, he, uh, what, what James Morrison refers to is, why did we see a shift towards free trade before Britain became the hegemon? So he says, we saw a shift towards free trade in the 1780s. I discussed that last week already that we saw the first, uh, the first experiments with free trade policies by the British government in the 1780s. And that was before Britain was the hegemon. He also explicitly refers to the paper by Krasner. He basically attacks Krasner and says, look, Krasner says we saw free trade when Britain was the hegemon, but we actually saw free trade policies before Britain was the hegemon. And the paper is actually exactly structured exactly the same way as Krasner's. He talks about the dependent variable, the independent variable, and so on. So if you read the two papers, you will see how Morrison directly speaks to Krasner. And his argument is it's not power, actually. It's something else. It's so the argument about the role of power is purely rationalist. It's all about material interests that influence state behavior. Morrison uses a so-called constructivist approach. <coughs> he says that it's actually ideas and not the material interests, but, the, but uh, the ideas and norms that, uh, that, are, that are being disseminated among policymakers. And these ideas are particularly important in times of crisis. It's the so-called critical juncture. So if a, system is in, if a system is working well and somebody proposes new ideas, nobody's going to care. Right? Because why should we use do something else if everything's going well? But these new, new, new ideas <coughs> come into play when a system is into crisis uh, is falling into crisis, and we are starting to look for new solutions to this crisis, to the problems that we're having, because the old ideas are not working anymore. So that's a critical juncture. So the crisis of the old system provides an opportunity for new ideas to unfold their power. And for this to take place, what we need is a so-called ideas entrepreneur. And Morrison says Adam Smith was such a powerful ideas entrepreneur. And he frames the events of the time of the 1780s or before <coughs> as a crisis to key policymakers and offers new solutions, which is this new liberal system that was not, that did not exist before. So, as I said, he says, what Krasner says is insufficient. We saw free trade or attempts to promote free trade before Britain was a hegemon. Uh, and what really happened is that th the context was such that the British system was in a crisis. We had the American I in the, uh, Revolutionary War. The U.S. just split off and became independent, which caused big political repercussions in Britain. We saw uprisings in Ireland in, the, in, uh, in 1779, and Britain didn't know really how to deal with these things. <coughs> so what Smith did, that's the argument by, by, uh, by Morrison is, he tried to pick key policymakers. And one key policymaker back then was <coughs> uh, Shelburne. He's called Shelburne. And he was clearly mercantilist before he met Smith. And he became the prime minister from eight, uh, 1782. And what Morrison claims is that M Adam Smith used the opportunity of this crisis to offer these new or convince Shelburne of these new ideas. So there's a story about how they traveled from, from Edinburgh to London together. And Adam Smith kept talking to Shelburne like how great liberalism is. And eventually, he, he, uh, he convinced Shelburne that these new liberal ideas would actually, would actually present a solution to these problems that Britain was facing at the time. 
So there's this nice quote in, in Morrison's paper um, where Shelburne, in his memoirs, he said, I own to a journey I made with Mrs. Smith from Edinburgh to London in 1761, the difference between light and darkness. The novelty of his principles made me unable to comprehend them at, at the time, but he urged them with so much eloquence that they took a certain, a certain hold which, uh, though it did not arrive at full conviction for some years later, I can truly say uh, has constituted ever since the happiness of my life. So this is what can happen to you once you uh, talk too much to uh, liberals. Anyway, so that's the takeaway point here is that these ideas themselves are can be fairly powerful but only under certain circ circumstances. And that's how, at least by this argument, which you, uh, which is also, as usual, criticized a lot, can actually take a sh mean that, that the course of international political economy or the international system t uh, shifts into a new direction. So the last way that I want to, uh, that I want to discuss, the last way to examine these uh, the importance of these ideas and the key claims that that these schools of, uh, make is by looking at actual data, right? We could test whether these hypotheses that mercantilists, for instance, uh, put forward actually hold in practice. So this data from one of my papers. So what we did is we simply looked at the current account of a uh, of the main industrialized countries in the post-war period. <coughs> so, the mercantilists say, you should run a trade surplus, and the trade surplus is the major component of the current account. The current account uh, is the trade balance plus net income of a country, right? So the mercantilists say, powerful countries should run, uh, or everybody should run a, a trade surplus, but that's of course not possible. So who should run the, 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 the surplus? It should be the most powerful countries, right? That would be one hypothesis that we can test. So what we have here is, so this is, each of those columns is a country. So this New Zealand, Portugal, Greece, uh, Ireland, uh, Netherlands, Norway, so this dark dot is the mean current account of that country from in the for, for the period for which we have data in the in after 1950. So this from 1950 to 2010, that's the mean trade balance of New Zealand. And as you can see, it's very negative. It's minus six or seven percent. And these other dots are just the specific years. So no, New Zealand some once had a surplus, but in all the other years it had a deficit. So we order them by their mean current account. So, as we, so we are moving from a deficit once we move from left to right. So these are the countries which on average had a, a current account surplus. These are the countries which on average had a current account deficit in the post-war period. So Netherlands is always, almost always running surpluses. Norway, Germany is here. And the winner, of course, is Switzerland. So you see how positive the current account is. This is partially because of net income, but it's also because of the trade balance. So is this consistent with mercantilism? What would you expect? So the US is here, I think. Britain is here. What would, what would we expect and what, is, what do we see? Yeah. Yeah. So, from a mercantilist logic, the most powerful countries should be the ones that that run the that run the the surpluses. But that's not the case in practice, right? So Germany would fall into that category that confirms it, and Japan. But then we've got the U.S. and and Great Britain. <coughs> that run consistently run deficits, and then we've got Australia, 
which is also always in deficits, not the least powerful country, right? It's not the most powerful country, but it's not as that weak that it would also always be, have a, such a negative balance. So there must be something else. I mean, one paper uh, that I wrote, we asked that questions, question, why do countries have divergent long-term trade balances? And our answer is it's not power, it's actually domestic institutions. So we're now moving, offering an explanation that's based on domestic politics. So more broadly, it's a paper that ex says domestic institutions have strong effects on international politics, right? And what we say is that it's uh, wage bargaining institutions. So there's a huge literature in comparative politics that, that looks at different types of wage bargaining. So you can either bargain wages in specific sectors uh, or independent of what the other sector does, or you can coordinate across the whole economy. So in Germany, for instance, what you do is uh, you, set, uh, you set a wage in the export-oriented industry, in car manufacturing, for instance. And that wage is coordinated with the wage that's being set or being negotiated in the public sector, right? And the public sector does not have a direct effect on competitiveness of, of uh, car manufacturers. But indirectly, indirectly it does. What happens is if the wages in the car manufacturing remain low, to remain so that the firm remain comp comp remains competitive, but wages increase a lot in the public sector. In the long term, people will just move from one from the sector that pays less to the sector that pays more. So wage bargaining coordination among different sectors helps you to keep wages low in the export-oriented sectors. So that's that's called wage compression. So countries with a coordinated wage bargaining system find it easier to keep wages low and therefore their firms are more competitive. For instance, a system like Germany or the Netherlands and Austria, that's what they do. Why in the US or in Britain or in Australia, that's not what you do. There's no coordination among the sectors. Therefore, it's more difficult to keep wages low. And if you look at this, if you examine this empirically, what you see is that this is an index, a measure of wage bargaining coordination. So this is low wage or no wage bargaining coordination. So there's no wage bargaining co coordination in the US. And this is very high wage bargaining coordination. And what you see is that though, so you see a positive correlation. If there's low wage bargaining coordination, the current account is predicted to be negative. And once you move to coordinated wage bargaining, co uh, wage bargaining the current account becomes positive. So this is the predicted current account controlling for other, ca for other factors, like capital flows and so on, uh, given a certain degree of wage bargaining. So more coordinated wage bargaining leads to a higher current account, and a less coordinated wage bargaining leads to a lower current account. And that's in, that's, that has nothing to do with anything mercantilist. It simply depends on domestic institutions, how they actually favor certain uh, groups and how that then reflects in international foreign affairs, in this case, in trade, right? So that already talks to next week. Next week, we're gonna talk about different approaches of, uh, uh, in an, an analytical framework. We're gonna look at systemic theories. How can we use, which factors on the international level matter to explain foreign economic policy, for instance, power. Then we're going to discuss how domestic politics matters and domestic institutions matters to ex explain foreign economic policies. So this is an example of an argument that focuses on domestic institutions, while Krasner is an, arg an example of an argument that focuses on international factors. Uh, just bear with me two more minutes. So to conclude, so we have this mercantilist, mercantilism, liberalism debate, and we can see that as an equivalent to the, to the debate between realism and liberalism in international relations theory, right? Uh, 
What these schools do is they offer powerful ideas and they still influence policymakers, but they are less useful as an analytical framework. So what we're going to do next week is we're going to develop an, uh, such a framework based on what I think is modern international political economy <coughs> um, that highlights the interests and institutions of voters, of interest groups, of classes, of uh, countries and examines how these interests and the power of an actor that has a certain interest, how they then lead to a certain policy outcome that uh, helps us to explain what we see today. So that's what we're going to do next week. Next week we're going to develop this framework, which might be a bit theoretical, but I think it's really useful because we can then use it in the weeks after to understand specific questions. So next we're going to develop we're going to develop this framework based on studies in, in international relations uh, that you should know or some of you of them you know from your previous courses. Thanks a lot. <coughs>